cheese wheel? A water Davian cheese wheel? Now that's worth killing for! No one has as many friends as the man with many cheeses! Ladies, gentlemen, and adventurers of all ages, as you continue to move forward through the massive, sprawling, beautiful world of Baldur's Gate 3, many of us are just moving through the world as we see fit, stumbling upon random stories, quests, and items one at a time, but while this can be incredibly enjoyable, it also makes it very, very easy to miss some stuff that you may well wish that you hadn't. And so today we're going to go over 10 incredible pieces of equipment that you do not want to miss along your journey within this wonderful game. I'll be going over them in a sort of chronological order, talking about the ones you can find earlier on first. First, then moving to a slightly later area, so that way if you are trying to avoid spoilers, you can instantly know when to move on if you spot something a little bit unfamiliar. That said, let's begin with number one, the Smuggler's Ring. This one is located in the wilderness area quite early on, and not even in a locked off area by any means. It is simply a ring that gives you some stat trade-offs, specifically a good one for a stealthy type character like a rogue, as it gives you plus two stealth, plus two to sleight of hand as well, but it also gives you minus one charisma, so better at sneaking, lock picking, pickpocketing, and worse at talking, which seems a fair trade-off to me, especially in a party of four where only one of you actually needs to be good at the whole talking side of things. That said, this ring is found nearest to the Blighted Village Waypoint. North of here, you will find a broken bridge that you have to jump across, and then, of course, you do so. Continue to the right until you have a way to actually descend to the lower area right beside the river, and then just a few steps to the left over here where I've marked, you will find a skeleton sort of half-hidden in a bush, almost like it's being smuggled by the bush. Open up the skeleton's loot table and you'll find yourself a lovely smuggler's ring within. Number two, Amulet of Misty Step. This one is also found relatively early on in the wilderness area. Specifically though, this one is inside of the goblin camp, which means you need to either make temporary peace with the goblins to let you run around their area, or you need to wage all out war with them and fight your way through, though that is absolutely much tougher. Once in the goblin camp though, use the heavy oak doors at the back to reach the shattered sanctum area. Walk towards the center of the big room here, and if you are still early on in the story, true soul guts will be standing on this platform. You can talk to them if you want, lead them back to their bedroom if they are willing, which is of course over here as you progress on the left. The reason for this is that the entrance to where we want to access is this door on the right side of the room, and to do so you need one of two things. Either a key, which is dropped when Guts dies if you kill them, then you can do that secretly and stealthily in this room if you wish, or you can lockpick the door if you have someone with the right skill set and tools. Either way, get through the door, enter it, and you'll be in the Defiled Temple area. There will be a fight in here the first time you arrive, and then in the back of the room beside the bed there is a gilded chest. Inside of the chest, you will find the amulet. I've already gotten mine, which is why it isn't sitting in the chest itself. What this does, though, is quite simple when you read its name. It gives you the ability to cast Misty Step as a bonus action once per short rest. This can be game-changing as far as traversal, letting you explore harder-to-reach areas quite easily, but also invaluable in combat. Basically, free movement as a bonus action that also doesn't trigger attacks of opportunity is very strong to be able to have from an amulet. Number three, Phalar Aluv. I, I have no idea how to pronounce that, and I'm sorry. Now this is quite a neat one though, a rare quality magic longsword with some special properties seemingly drow in origin. To get this one you will have to have had reached the Underdark region. There are multiple ways to do so, so I won't show you how, but the easiest one from which to get this sword is if you have access to is the Defiled Temple entrance, which will place you in the Selenite Outpost. The sword is simply at this location on your map. You can get here from any way that you please, it's not actually hard to reach, but personally I enjoy making Lazel jump about 60 feet in a single bound, and then you want a character with a good strength or religion stat to interact with the rock the sword is in. Either choice requires a reasonably high check to break through, but if you do succeed, you get the sword straight up, no problem. This is Phalar Louvre, also known as the Singing Sword. 1d10 damage two-handed, 1d8 one-handed, plus one from weapon enchantment, plus one to your performance stat, which is a nice little bonus, then the big kicker here, which is Phalar Louvre, Melody. This adds an extra action to your bar. If you select it, it will give you two options. Phalar Louvre Shriek, giving all enemies within six meters, minus one d4 to charisma, wisdom, and intelligence saving throws, as well as making them take an extra 1d4 thunder damage. The other option is Phalar Aloof Sing, which grants all allies within 6 meters a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls, and also charisma, wisdom, and intelligence saving throws, essentially a short range bless. Either of these effects last for 5 turns, and you can only use one of them per short rest, but this is relatively powerful, especially in the right hands. Number 4, Morning Frost. And this is where things start to get a little bit fun. This is still all in the Underdark, so no worries about that, but this weapon is 
actually created from multiple pieces scattered around the area. Specifically, you have to find three parts of it and then use the combine function to make the actual item itself a very rare quarterstaff called Morning Frost. As for getting each of the three pieces then, well, the first one is right by that last weapon I just showed you over by the Selenite Outpost. If you've never been here before, there's actually a window in the Selenite Outpost that you can exit on the western side. This will bring you to an overhang with a bunch of petrified people. Getting closer will initiate an encounter that I won't spoil more than necessary, but once the fight is finished, you want to loot a character named Dorn, who was likely unpetrified during the fight. And here you will find the Icy Helve piece of this weapon. Then for the next step, you need to head to the Susser Tree area in the Underdark on the absolute western side of the area. Once you reach right around this pin, a fight will start, finish the fight, and then loot our friend Philo down here, and on his corpse you will find the Icy Crystal item. After that, there is one more step left. Go to the Mycadid Colony in the north. Ideally, you want to make friends with these people instead of pissing them off, at least personally, and then they will ask you to take out the Draugr down on the beach as they are clearly preparing to attack them. Do so and you'll be granted access to what is basically the Mycanid treasure room. Inside of here, the only obvious thing is a corpse on the ground, but if you walk up and loot it, you will find the final piece of our beautiful icy weapon. So go into your inventory, right-click on one of the pieces and hit combine, drag the other two icy pieces in, and voila, the Morning Frost Quarter Staff. 1d8 and two-handed, 1d6 one-handed, plus a bonus 1d4 of cold damage either way. This weapon also has the effect of giving plus one damage to any cold damage dealt, as well as giving you a chance to apply the chilled status whenever you hit with cold damage. The weapon is plus one enchanted, and it also gives you access to Ray of Frost, which has no cooldown, because, well, it, it's a cantrip, which means that you can just cast it infinitely. It gives you just a bonus cantrip just as a whole. But hey, it's quite a cool weapon in general. Excuse the pun. Number five, Shadow of Menzo Barin's Zen. Sorry if it sounds like I sneeze, but this is just a special stealthy helmet, and you will likely be quite happy to know that it's basically just a bonus reward from completing part of the last item, because that item was found in three places, and the last one happened to also have some other goodies in it, specifically that final stop, the Mykonid Treasure Room. The corpse is the only obvious thing in here, but if you hover your mouse around the area a little bit, or if you just hold Alt, you will see that there is just a random item with a crazy long name sitting on the side. Pick it up, and you'll find a magic helmet called the Shadow of Menzo Barra, and this will grant you the Shrouded in Shadow spell for genuine invisibility for two turns, usable once every short rest. Nothing else on the helmet, but that is an incredibly useful spell to have access to when you need it, so keeping this helmet around for the right situations is a really good idea, especially as you can essentially get it as a byproduct of grabbing Morning Frost anyways. Number six, Ring of Salving. Sticking to the Mykonid Colony area, there's actually quite a bit that you can find here. If you go to the vendor area in the back corner, you will find Omilum. He sells a number of interesting items, but perhaps the most interesting, or at least the most valuable one in my opinion, the Ring of Salving. This is a green ring, actually very low sell price too, which makes it a steal really, considering what the effect is, which is simply that any time that you heal a creature while wearing this, that healing is granted a bonus two with no RNG attached to it. Every party should have a healer, it's just the way the game works, and a healer wearing this will simply be more effective than otherwise. It is just a straight up power increase, and it's hard to ignore for its genuinely low price. For an alternative, however, we have number seven, the Circle of Blasting. This one is also in the Mykonid Colony, also from a vendor, in fact, even in the same corner, but this time you want to talk to Blurg instead, right beside him. He too sells a number of interesting items, but my personal favorite is the Circlet of Blasting. It has a reasonably hefty cost, for sure, especially when compared to the ring we just talked about, but it gives you access to the Scorching Ray spell once per long rest, which is an extremely powerful spell. 66 of damage split across three locations, or piled in one place, but the fact that you can choose how to move that damage around is incredibly potent. And even though you can only use it once per long rest, not only will using this once completely change the landscape of a difficult fight if you want to, but you can also, you know, just take the item off after you use it until you next sleep and use something else for a bit. That, that's the sort of beauty of this being a video game, is that you can min-max stuff like that that would normally be a real faux pas in normal tabletop Dungeon Dragons. Number eight, the Light of Creation. The next couple of items are also in the Underdark area then, also relatively connected to each other, but first you have to head to the Arcane Tower in the southern side of the area. When getting in here for the first time, there are turrets that will attack you if you end a turn in their line of sight, so just slowly work your way around the side safely without getting hurt. Once you reach the tower itself, enter the open window, and then exit the balcony on the southern side of the building. Here you can carefully parkour your way down to the bottom in the garden outside. There will be a little tree with a couple of Susser flowers under it, so grab one of them, then break down the door to the bottom floor of the tower itself, and stick the flower in the elevator to activate it as that is its actual power source. Take the elevator to the top floor, and you will come across a bunch of constructs. When you defeat them, the boss enemy of the group will have this halberd on its metallic corpse. This weapon does 1d10 damage with an extra 1d6 of lightning damage, which is actually pretty solid, plus one weapon enchantment of course, but it also has the negative chance to stun the wielder occasionally if they aren't a construct. So strong weapon, high damage potential, but also a bit of a drawback, so up to you 
whether you want to actually use this properly and consistently or not, but don't worry, even if not, this journey was not a waste in the slightest because of number nine, the Staff of Arcane Blessing. The same construct in the Arcane Tower also dropped an orange ring called Guiding Light, which gives you the light cantrip, which is mostly just sort of whatever, except if you read the description of the item, its purpose becomes properly clear. Go back to the elevator, put on the ring, and a new button will appear on the elevator that says Basement. Press it, and the elevator will go to a secret room with a number of goodies for you to pick up, but very much arguably the most important of which being the Staff of Arcane Blessing, which is actually insanely powerful. This stack gives you the Bless spell once per long rest, which is nice, but I would actually recommend using it on a character that you have that already knows Bless, because its secondary effects on Bless are nuts. So the staff itself is 1d8 when two-handed, 1d6 when one-handed, doesn't matter much because it's more of a caster weapon anyways though. The special effect, however, makes it so friendlies targeted by Bless get an additional 1d4 bonus when rolling saving throws or attack rolls, which makes this literally double the effect of what Bless does normally. But then it has another bonus of 2d4s on spell attack rolls, so triple the effect for those. So essentially this is just the Bless God Staff, and if you have someone who knows Bless, you should be using this whenever you use Bless. If you have a spellcaster who isn't otherwise occupied, I would even recommend using this anyways, just because it is damn powerful even with the once per long rest Bless that comes with it. Number 10, the Soulbreaker Greatsword. This beautiful piece of art of a weapon is located in the mountain pass region of the game that you access after the wilderness, so you will actually have to get there to be able to get it. Once here, you also have to have accessed the Gith Yankee Kreish, which isn't the biggest deal for the most part. Just head to the Rosy Morn Monastery in the north of this region, and then you can work your way through it, not too bad. Once you've reached the Kreish itself, if you want this sword, you may have to partake in just a touch of violence. You don't need to kill everyone, not by any means. You don't even need to make most of the people here your enemy. You simply have to kill the leader of the group in the captain's quarters area. If you do this in this secluded room, you only have to kill three Gith as well as two wolves, and no one else will aggro on you as a result. This doesn't really block you out of anything important either, so you don't lose much from this other than the morality of choosing to attack someone purely because you maybe want their weapon. But hey, th that's up to you. Simply kill the leader then, and then on their corpse, you will loot the Soulbreaker Greatsword. This thing is absolutely nasty strong for a number of reasons. 2d6 base damage is a great sword, of course, plus 1d4 psychic damage if the wielder is Gith, which is great, it makes it an absolutely perfect weapon for Lazel, for example. It also grants the wielder plus two to initiative, which is fantastic to have. Weapon enchant plus one for a bit of bonus as well, but then even past that, it has a unique inherent weapon skill if you are proficient with great swords, which is a normal attack, but it comes with five bonus psychic damage just for fun, and has a stun chance with a con save from the enemy that lasts for two turns if successful. And this recharges on a short rest. In other words, this sword is ridiculously strong. It, high base damage, higher damage even then if used by a gith. Bonus initiative, which is great, and a guaranteed massive damage attack with stun chance once per short rest. What else is there really to say about that other than it's pretty solid? And that's about it for today, everyone. Another collection of 10 valuable, important items, equipment, and weapons, as well as where to find them just to make sure that you are able to get the most out of your journey through Baldur's Gate 3 and make sure that you haven't missed anything in areas that you've already been to. I hope you've enjoyed this breakdown and I hope it has helped you collect a few more fun trinkets to alter your ongoing journey through the game. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world our stage Is, uh, goodbye